man, you just want to know that when you leave this place, whenever that is, did I make an impact? Is this world a better place? Um, because I was here. Well, you know what? You know what? Um, for Tim Green, it is. And I had no idea that was coming. And so thank you. Mark Brunel, thanks for joining us today. It's very cool to get an inside perspective on one of the most exciting teams in the NFL, the Detroit Lions. The Lions Cinderella story came up just one game short of the Super Bowl last year. But aside from football, you've also been a personal hero and inspiration to me because of your great faith and equanimity. Tim, thank you for having me, both you guys. It's, it's an honor to be uh, on this. And uh, Tim, it was, uh, it was a dream come true last year uh, for myself, for the Detroit Lions, for, this city, for the city of Detroit. We got so close. We got so close to getting to that Super Bowl. But it was a fun year. Um, I'll never forget it. And uh, um, But I know we'll, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit. But, uh, you know, we're still floating. We're still pretty excited. And we've got a little work to do, obviously. And, we, you know, our goal, like every – like the goal of every NFL team is to win a championship. So we are in pursuit of that right now, working hard this offseason – uh, but guys, thank you for having me on. It really is a privilege. Tim, I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time. And one of the things that I'm so grateful for is that I think your last year, Tim, was in 1993, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? With the Atlanta yeah. Falcons? Yeah, that's, that's right. 93. And my first year was 1993. So I'm just thankful that I didn't have to worry about you chasing me all over the football field in my NFL career. So, um, Guys, thanks for having me. That's a real privilege, and I'm looking forward to talking talking with you. You're listening to Tim Green's Nothing Left Unsaid. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider liking and subscribing to support us. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. My first question is this. What was it like growing up in Santa Maria, California? What did your parents do? Did you have any siblings? Were you a church-going family with a strong faith? Yes. Um, so Santa Maria, California is really was and is a farming community. Uh, many of my friends that I grew up with were farmers. Um, most of my friends that I grew up with are still in Santa Maria, California. It is Southern California, but not like the Southern California you see on TV. Like I said, uh, uh, farming community, real laid back, real quiet, real conservative for the state of California. I had a great childhood, a great upbringing. Uh, my parents, Dave and Sharon Brunell, um, wonderful parents, wonderful people. Uh, we were a church-going family. I have a younger brother who is four years younger than me. His name is Matthew. Uh, we are very close, and they are no longer in California. They moved to Colorado. They just got out of California when uh, California started turning into California, if I can say that. Um, um, but their uh, parents are still uh, uh, still around, still very much uh, in my life, very close with them as I am with my brother. Um, I had a good upbringing. Uh, we never went without. I was very fortunate. Um, there were other kids that had more and could do more things and go to different places. Man, I didn't care. My dad was a teacher and a coach. Uh, my mom worked in real estate. Uh, it was great. I had a wonderful upbringing. Did your dad coach you when you were in high school or growing yes, up? Yes, he did. So my dad and my brother are baseball guys, baseball guys. And so that was the main sport growing up. He coached me uh, in high school baseball. He coached me in middle school football. And um, But he was the varsity baseball coach when I was in high school. He helped out with the JV team, the varsity football team a little bit. He played a little quarterback in high school. But I will say he was it was what was great about him being a teacher at the high school that I went to, St. Joseph High School, uh, and a coach being my coach is that my dad was always in my life. Um, my dad was always there, uh, which, you know, you don't realize how fortunate you are to have that uh, until you get away from it. Um, very grateful that he was there, even when I didn't want him there. He was there to <laughs> kind of keep me keep me in line, and uh, I'm very grateful for that because you know I grew up as so many kids they grow up with 
where dads just simply aren't around, not because they don't want to be around, just they just can't be around, whether they're traveling with work or in a profession that demands a lot of time. Um, my dad was always around, which was great. And uh, uh, it was a good lesson for me because I think it was very good for me, as it would be uh, for most young men. And uh, I've always tried to remember that for my children. Just be there. Be there as much as, as you can. Sometimes it's very hard, uh, but it's very important. You mentioned you and your brother were close. Did you guys have any competitiveness with sports? Or were you, I guess, four years, maybe there was enough of an age gap there. No, that's a very good point. We, there was enough, enough of an age gap. Uh, now, we, we'd play out in the front yard. We'd shoot hoops. We'd play a little catch. Uh, I'd pitch to him or something, hit him ground balls, whatever it was. But I don't know if we ever got competitive. He was, I was the older brother. He was the younger brother. And uh, I was more looking out for my brother, Matt, than I ever was trying to beat my brother, Matt. Now, if we're a couple years closer together, absolutely. Now, I will say we did fight. There was a lot of fighting going on. Um, and it, it, would get, it would get a little, it'd get a little nasty sometimes. But, but uh, uh, I mean, he's my little brother. And uh, uh, that's just, you know, often what, what brothers do, right? Troy, does that sound familiar? <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Brothers. Yes, uh, yeah, brothers. My brothers. And yeah, even with my sisters, we were all really close, but fought. And then I think, too, he's saying it sounds familiar with being around. My dad, it's funny. So, Mark, when I was, I think I told this story on, on here before, so I got to be careful I don't repeat it too many times. But when I was in uh, middle school, I, I didn't, that's when I found out my dad had a, I thought he announced football games for fun because I knew he worked for Fox. I, didn't, I had no clue that he was paid to do that. And I knew <laughs> how much he loved writing books. So I, again, I thought he just wrote books. I didn't know there was a contract and an agency. And a, so like when I was in elementary school, I'd be in class and they'd be like, you know, a, a parent's come and read to the class. And I'd be, you know, I'd look at the door and my dad would walk in to read, to, you know, or I'll sit in the carpet and read. I'm like, man, this guy's got so much time on his hands. <laughs> <laughs> and he would be coaching. He'd coach my youth baseball team at the same time he was coaching my brother's youth baseball team and my taking my sister to her horseback riding lessons and my little sister's, you know, whatever, T-ball team. I was like, man, this guy's got so much time. Must, you know, I, I genuinely believe that he had retired and we were living off of NFL money. I didn't know. NFL money in the 90s was very 80s and 90s no. very different than today. No, even for a first round pick, it wasn't nearly what it is it is yeah. today. <laughs> so, it's great. Mark, when you were you said they were ba your your dad's a baseball coach and your brother's a baseball guy, were you more drawn to football or were you just better at football? It's real simple. I played so much baseball growing up that I got to about halfway through high school and it just got stale. Um, I won't say boring. It never got boring, but it was kind of coming along at, at the time where I was, I was enjoying football more, getting a little attention with football and it was fast paced. Uh, it was, you know, everything that we know football to be. It just was, uh, for me at least, uh, much more interesting, um, much more physical. There were some components of it that I was drawn to the, the um, the different positions, the game planning, the strategy, uh, the physicality of it, the camaraderie. There's just something that football has, many things that football has that baseball just didn't have, uh, at least uh, in high school for me. Sure. And I was just drawn to it. I was uh, much more interested in it. Um, I was good at baseball, but I wasn't passionate about baseball. Um, but, uh, but football – each year in high school just got more and more interesting. And I think, too, when you're getting a little attention, some colleges are reaching out and you're getting some some letters, um, you know, that, that has a lot to do with it as well. Who taught you to throw a football and when did you know that you were really good? I mean, NFL good. You know, if there was one person that taught me how to throw, it, it would be my dad. However, not to take anything away from my dad or certainly not for me to boast in anything – I could just always throw Tim. Now my dad's right-handed. Um, I'm left-handed. My mom's left-handed. Maybe she taught me how to throw the dang thing. I don't know. She was pretty <laughs> athletic as well. Who knows? Uh, I always tease my dad. She was a better athlete than he was. Um, but um, I could just, you know, I think some guys can just naturally throw a football and, you know, um, 
maybe don't have to be taught. It just kind of comes out right. Um, so I, I think that's the truth. I don't re- ever remember somebody, you know, teaching me all, all this. And I'm sure there was some coaching with feed and coaching with me- throwing mechanics down the road. Uh, but, you know, when I was a kid, I could just I could just throw it. Now, it looked weird, Troy, because I was left handed. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess it came out OK. So how about how about the second part of that? When did you know when did you like really know uh, you probably knew you were talented when you were younger? When did you feel like you really could make that leap to the NFL. Oh, goodness. NFL, you know, um, uh, my goal was to play college football. I'll start there. And my dad kept me very grounded. He said, listen, there's, there's a lot of good college football players, a lot of good high school football players out there. He never really set my expectations too high. There was never a goal when I was a kid to get to the NFL. It just seemed so far out there and so uh, impossible to reach. And I watched the San Diego Chargers and the Dallas Cowboys, and I knew the players, but that the chance to play at that level, just it never, honestly, never crossed my mind ever. So I was good in high school, so I thought, okay, I could play college football. Um, but again, there wasn't a D1 goal or, or a school that, that uh, uh, or a conference that I, I just you know wanted to get to. I just wanted to get to college football somewhere. Then kind of my junior and senior year, there was some interest. At the end of my uh, junior and senior year, I – being a Southern California kid, I wanted to go to USC or UCLA or Stanford. Uh, those were my top three. The problem with that is none of those schools wanted me to, to go to <laughs> UCLA, USC or Stanford. I was down on the list, so whatever. Anyway, I went to Washington. I uh, enjoyed my career at Washington, had some success there, and uh, um, got banged up a little bit, had a knee injury, blew my knee out, and so really even the chance to play in the NFL seemed really bleak at that time, but got an opportunity. I might be fast forwarding a little bit, but, um, but I guess the opportunity to go to the NFL or the thought of going to the NFL when I was a kid, even in college seemed so far away that it honestly really never entered my mind until it really presented itself. And which was, uh, really kind of a surprise to me. Did you turn around your high school program or were they good already? Small private Catholic school, Pretty competitive, but could not really compete with the local public schools. We were in a league that uh, that we competed in, um, and we did well. I, I wouldn't say I turned, you know, myself or my teammates turned anything around. I think we kind of kept the tradition going. Might have had a little bit more success than we had had in the previous years, um, but it was it was it was a program that was well coached. We had some good teams in our league, and we had some poor teams in our league, so we were going to win some games. Um, but we got to the playoffs, you know, a, a few times. Didn't win a state championship, but, uh, you know, the years before us were pretty successful as as well. I imagine you were highly recruited, am I right? What made you ultimately decide to go to Washington? So I was recruited by West Coast teams. No, Nobody on the East Coast was interested in me, nor I don't think they ever heard about me. We were, where I grew up in Santa Maria was, was between LA and San Francisco. So we didn't get a lot of the, I guess the media attention or the college attention that, you know, a lot of the quarterbacks in Southern California or the Bay area got, cause it was really kind of hard to get to us, I guess. And, um, so I was recruited by UCLA, USC, Stanford, um, I was recruited by Cal and really that was it. Maybe some smaller schools, which those, those were great. And like I mentioned before, I wanted to stay in Southern California or go to Stanford. My dad really wanted me to go to Stanford for obvious reasons. And, but really there was no real interest on their part. Uh, but Washington, the university of Washington, which I, I didn't, I knew very little about. Um, I knew they were in Seattle. I knew they were, their uniforms had purple on them. And I knew, you know, they had some success in years past, but I didn't, Tim, Troy, I didn't, I didn't know a whole lot about them, but I was number one on their list and you kind of go where you're wanted. So I went up to Washington and um, I had a great experience there, but I wasn't a, a, a national recruit. I wouldn't, wasn't a four star or a five star like they have them now. 
Um, just kind of a West Coast kid that was, you know, was a little recruited, but I was I was uh, wasn't really highly sought after. But it and it worked out for the best because I ended up exactly where I was supposed to be. Did you meet your wife, Stacy, at Washington? Do you remember what you said to her the first time you met? <laughs> yes. And when I say it worked out, when I went to Washington, that's exactly what I meant, Tim. Tim, <laughs> you nailed it. That's exactly what I meant. So um, I met Stacy at the leg extension machine in the weight room at the University of Washington. And and Troy, you can't get any more romantic than that right there. <laughs> yeah, the rest, the leg extension the rest machine. is history. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> she ran track and cross country for Washington. And I can remember we were in spring football and we're in Husky stadium and we're on the turf. We're practicing. Well, there's a, in Husky stadium back then there was a track that went around the football field. And I just noticed this, this cute brunette with short hair running around the track. And, and, uh, um, that was the first time I ever saw her. Didn't know a thing about her. And as it turns out, the next uh, semester, I had a class with her. So, Troy, I kind of stalked her for at least two, two and a half months. You know, I didn't never had the, the courage to uh, just walk up and talk to her. Um, but she catch me staring at her at, uh, in uh, Communications 203 uh, with Dr. <laughs> Donald Pember. And uh, uh, she'd catch me looking at her. Anyway, I could go on and on. But I did meet her in the weight room. And, and gosh, I don't even know what I said. We were introduced by a mutual friend and, and, uh, whatever I said, I could promise you this. It did not come out very well. It just didn't. There's no way. Cause I was so nervous and I was over, I was just consumed with just like, I can't mess this up. This girl's way too pretty for me. Um, I'm in over my head. I've got no chance. What am I doing here? So whatever I said, I, Tim, it did not come out well, but that was the start. And we've been married 32 years. So I, Apparently, I didn't mess it up too bad, but but uh, anyway, that that's our story. That's awesome. Yeah, she, whatever you yeah. said, it worked. That's it, all it worked. That's all, that, that's all that matters. That's right. That's right. How did you propose to her? Um, old fashioned. I got up in my. I was in my best suit. I uh, uh, I had. I asked her to come over to my apartment, and because. You know, we were planning on getting married. I think she knew I was going to ask her. Well, she didn't know I was going to ask her. And uh, um, I thought, you know, if I take her out somewhere in some really nice romantic spot, she's going to know. So I said, hey, you want to just come over and hang out or something? So she came to my apartment and she and when she walked in into into the apartment, I was there on a knee with the ring flowers, I'm sure. And the nicest suit. And so that's that's when I asked her to marry, uh, marry me. And we were still in college. I needed to. I needed to marry her before she came to her senses. So uh, we were we were married. We were married in college. Started our family really quick. And uh, but yeah, I, I remember exactly where I was when I proposed, and and uh, I'm grateful she said yes. How old were you at that point in college? Ah, twenty two, twenty two. I think it was. Yeah. So you're pretty. You moved pretty quick. Were you were you kind of uh, I guess mature beyond, beyond your years. I guess in some areas I was, but in other areas I was immature, insecure, uh, like most kids that are in their early 20s, I guess. At least that I could speak for myself. But I understood the importance of hard work. I understood uh, what it meant to be a good, fa a good father because I had a good father, a good husband because my dad was a good husband. I learned a lot from you know, my dad on what it meant to, to, to be a good man. He was a good man. Um, but listen, even at 22, regardless of what I knew and didn't know, I had a long way to go as I soon found out. Um, but, um, I guess I had some stuff together, uh, at that age, but still had a lot of growth to do as it, you know, as, as it would certainly play out, you know, and, uh, it's still playing out in my life. But, uh, um, yeah, I don't know about mature, but I guess I had some things down. You seem like, uh, and obviously I've known you for all the 10 minutes, but you seem like <laughs> a, like an old school, you know, an old school kind of guy. So getting married young is like, uh, anyways, it, it fits, I guess. <laughs> it fits what I was picturing. Yes. Well, I'll tell this in, in all transparency. Uh, uh, we, we, I'll just say this. We started a family 
very quickly. And so uh, we were married in college. We had a baby in college. Our daughter, Caitlin, is just about to turn 32. So the process was sped up awfully, awfully quick. And so, you know, Stacy was expecting her to, for me to ask her. Um, things happened really fast our junior year in college. And with no regrets, um, I look back and it was a very difficult time because as we were dating and, and we were about to have a family and, but we were going to do it right. We were going to get married and we did. And then our baby, uh, Caitlin came, um, the following year. And so there was a lot of growing up that we had to do at a very young age. And, uh, um, but man, it worked out. We have four beautiful children. Our daughter's amazing. Our boys are amazing. And, uh, again, I, we've been married 32 years early on. Was it tough? Absolutely. Um, so I had to get very old school quick, um, uh, to answer your question. And, uh, but man, I, I look back and it was just, Tim and Troy, it was it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. Did I do it right? No, I did not. Uh, was it what we had planned? No, it wasn't. But looking back, um, man, it really came together, and I'm I'm grateful. I'm grateful that He, that the Lord, has uh, kept us together and turned something that um, wasn't planned into something that, for me, I believe was very much planned by Him. Maybe the best way to put it. You had a few of those, right? I mean, so far in your Mm. chronological story, you wanted to be in, you wanted to be in Southern California and kind of accidentally fell into the perfect situation at Washington. Then, you you know, accidentally started your family. Now it's married. You said 32 years and and four kids. I mean, kind of accidentally, like you you said, almost like it's uh, written already, right? Yes. And I think, I think Troy, and it's hard to grasp and for many, it's hard to understand or believe. But um, when we are his, it's all written. I believe that as hard as it might be, right? As hard as it might be. Um, I believe it's all written and um, very, very difficult to grasp that and absorb that and live that. Um, but he certainly is controlling. He loves us. And he takes us through th- us takes us through things, and he allows things to happen that we're like, really, really, and yet, um, and yet, we could trust that he has a plan, right? We yeah, can. I'm, I'm, I'm sure my dad's going to get to this. So I might be jumping. I might be cutting him off a little bit. But did you did you feel that way your whole life, or did you have a moment in your life that kind of flipped that switch for you? Um, I. I I feel because Stacy and I were faced with something very early. I feel like, and then since then we've had a series of things like, really, um, not our plan, not what we had in mind. This is not how we were writing the story. So I feel like I've always had that. As difficult as it has been to walk through different things, um, and family and business and and. All you know, it's it's uh, I've always felt that way, I guess. And but it doesn't make it easier the next time you go through something. Um, you like to think that your your trials and your difficult times and the adversity that are you're presented with is over. I don't know if it ever gets to it, it, it ever ends. Um, I think we're always going through through things. Um, but I've also believed too that you know nothing happens to us that doesn't go through him first. Um, and he allows things to happen. Things don't surprise him. Um, they don't just surpri- surprise God at all. Um, he walks us through those things. He takes us through those things. Uh, and through that, those processes, he, he turns us into something better. Um, I do believe that, but man, going through it, sure, it sure doesn't make it easy, but I do believe that that's just, it's part of life. It's obviously a difficult part of life. That to this day, even though I trust him, I look back and I think, okay, I get it. I get it. Um, but it. But it can be very hard, as we all know. After college, you were selected in the fifth round of the NFL draft by the Green Bay Packers. You were the fourth quarterback taken in the draft, but your backup quarterback at Washington was drafted in the third round. That must have been a shock, right? 
Um, I don't know about a shock. Um, Billy was pretty good. I backed up Billy um, after I blew out my knee, and we won the national championship, and then he started most of my senior year. I don't think I was shocked. I honestly, I was just disappointed, probably a little jealous, too, that um, he was drafted before me. Not surprised by it at all because he really was good. Um, but he went in the third. I went in the fifth. I was like, oh, man, oh, man. But uh, but it didn't last long. I, when I got to where I, was, where I was drafted, I realized that I was in the right spot. And grateful for being in that spot. I got a chance to back up Brett, learn from Brett. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. I didn't have to play right away, which was good for me because I wasn't ready. Um, but uh, so it played out perfectly. Uh, he was drafted on – Billy was drafted on day one of, of the draft. I was day two back then. And so that was kind of hard. Um, but, hey, it, it played out fine. And – uh but uh, and I'm happy for Billy. Billy was 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 and is a good guy, and he ended up in a in a good spot. But but uh, we kind of went in different directions after after our uh, after the draft. So when you join Green Bay, you're Brett Favre's backup. Then in year two, Favre goes down with a hip pointer, and you orchestrated a 49 yard <laughs> touchdown drive, where you ended up running it in from the five yard line. You must have thought. This is easy, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if I wasn't, yeah, Tim, if I wasn't so terrified, I would have thought it was very easy. Uh, so I was, I was back up. Brett went down the first quarter, like you said, with a hip or something, whatever it was. And I thought, and we were in the Metrodome. We were playing the Vikings. Uh, you remember John Randall. John Randall was in his prime. And I can remember walking out in, on the field in the Metrodome thinking, <laughs> golly, of all games, so it didn't take long for me to to show how nervous I was. Troy, I had a I had a swing pass to Edgar Bennett, my first pass in the NFL. I think the play was like twenty three Z in or something like that, and I kind of went through my reads. I was going to throw it to a wide route, and really it's just like swing route. I mean, Edgar Bennett probably might have been twelve yards from me. Couldn't have been an easier pass. I was so nervous, I bounced it to him, and he was just like right there. It was the easiest throw in the world. I was just terrified, and and uh, we I did lead a drive, and I did you know they called a quarterback draw, which is about all I could do then was run a quarterback draw, and but we lost the game. It was a close game. I think we lost ten to seven, but I did get in the game a little bit. It was my first time in there, and I can remember the next day I woke up. I was so sore, so sore. I got banged around a little bit. I didn't really play well, but I didn't play horribly. You know, I don't, I don't think I had an interception. I think I had a fumble snap or something like that. It wasn't too bad, but I got in there a little bit and, and uh, apparently it was, it was enough to catch the eye of Tom Coughlin who, who traded for me, you know, I guess a, a year later or less than a year later. So anyway, but yeah, uh, my first time in the NFL, um, it wasn't ideal, but at least I got in there, I guess. Yeah, definitely. It probably, you mentioned not starting right away helped you being behind someone like Favre too. must have been great yes. to be behind. A, it's not like you're behind anybody, right? I mean, you've got to learn from one of the greats. Yes, I was, it was huge. I can remember when I first got to Green Bay, we had a mini camp, a veteran mini camp. And, and, uh, and I can remember going in there and watching Brett Favre practice. And I can remember the, the velocity of the football that would come out of his hand. And I can remember watching him. He could throw it so hard and he was accurate and just the, the strength and the zip on the ball. And I thought, I honestly thought, guys, if I have to throw it like this guy, I will never make it in the NFL. If I have to look like that, there, there, there's just no chance. I can't do that. I physically can't throw it like that. And um, I found out that you didn't have to throw it like that to stay in the NFL. And he was he was very rare, very rare quarterback um when it comes to arm strength and so but i learned a lot from brett um this was early brett Favre, and uh you know i learned what to do and what not to do because he was still figuring it out at that time 
but I always remember Brett was very good to me. Um, he didn't have to be. Um, kind of took me under his wing, and he, you know, here he's only a couple years older than me, and uh, showed me the ropes a little bit, and um, learned a lot about football. Had good coaches around me. Um, the other quarterback at the time was was Ty Detmer, who became a lifelong friend. Learned a lot from Ty. It was just a really good environment for a rookie quarterback to go in there and learn. Um, West Coast system. Mike Holmgren was the head coach. John Gruden was on the staff. Andy Reid was on the staff. Um, and the, the band, Steve Mariucci was on the staff. And um, Dick Duran, Ray Rhodes. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. These great coaches that went on to just do great things and win win championships. Um, it was just a, it was just really good for a young quarterback. So I was there for two years, and then after that, uh, uh, got traded to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Then an interesting thing happens. Coach Ray Rhodes, the former defensive coordinator in Green Bay, gets the head coaching job in Philadelphia. He tries to line up a trade for you. But you must have figured, why go from backing up Brett Favre to backing up Randall Cunningham, two Hall of Fame quarterbacks, right? Right. No, you nailed it, actually. So I was this close to going to the the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, Ray became the head coach. Hired John Gruden to be the offensive coordinator. And when I was in Green Bay, John, Cru- uh, John Gruden was the quality control coach my first year. And then my second year, 1994, he was the wide receivers coach. So then he goes to Philly and wants to bring me with him. And so I was so close, like I said. But the reason I didn't go there, didn't get traded, and didn't really work out because they really saw uh, Randall Cunningham as having a little bit more football in him. Um, a few more starting years and they were right. He still, you know, had a lot of good football left in him and I didn't want to back up anymore. I wanted an opportunity to get on the field. And so that's when Jacksonville entered the picture. I still entered the Jacksonville as a backup, backing up Steve Berline, but I thought there was a better opportunity with an expansion team to get on the field and kind of see what happened. So Philly didn't work out and uh, Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Jaguars did. What is that? process like when you say it doesn't work out like I remember when my dad played he talked about the fact that teams like when he played he said teams just told you where to go and you showed up and then he said it started to change and then it got all the way to the point where you know he was again I'm speaking for your dad a little bit but he was telling me I was shocked he was when uh you know Eli Manning got drafted and said he wasn't going to go there and he was saying how he wished he wished he'd known that that was a rule when he was playing. <laughs> yeah, you, well, so you get a call that you're going to get traded, and and your your agent just say, you know, basically we don't want to do it, and they listened, or yeah, and it really wasn't. Um, it was, I think the whole process was pretty cordial. You know, it wasn't ugly. Like I didn't dig my heels in and say I'm not going there. I didn't t- make my stand. I didn't have enough juice to do that. Um, you know, you could, I think they agreed to the parameters, I think, as far as the compensation, a, a draft pick or two or whatever it was, that was, I think, agreed upon. Um, but the opportunity for me wasn't as good in Philly. And so we were kind of dragging our feet. And the good thing is you have an agent that does this for you. And uh, see, if it was going to get ugly, I wasn't going to be involved. Um that's what they're there for. And so, you know, it was kind of like taking a while. It wasn't really happening. And, you know, they were still talking about uh, uh, Randall. And uh, and then Jacksonville kind of makes a call and kind of gets us interested, gets me interested. And looking at the two teams, the opportunity was better. I think the compensation was about the same. One was Philly. One was Florida. Eh, um, yeah, right? Uh and um, I just thought I'd get a chance to play faster in Jacksonville. And I didn't have a lot of juice to to really demand anything. I just said, really, just ultimately was, you know what? Thank you. Uh, I'm flattered. Um, great opportunity. I know I, I know the system that, that Gruden's going to be running and that, that uh, Ray Rhodes wants. But, you know, I got this team down in Jacksonville that sounds much more appealing. And that's the direction we're going to go. And so that's... That's kind of happened how it happened. And the next morning, I was on a plane to, to Jacksonville. And I, listen, I couldn't even found Jacksonville on a map, but but uh, I knew it was in Florida. Uh, but it worked out. It worked out perfectly. So 
the Philadelphia trade goes away, and Jacksonville offers an even better trade to Green Bay, a third and fifth round pick in exchange for you. Yeah, that's right. And I don't know if it was the uh, the better trade. I, I guess, you know, Green, yeah, Green Bay must have, you know, they were involved too, so they, they were happy. I was, I will tell you the story that um, my wife was out of town when all of this was happening. And um, in her mind, she was, we were going to Philly. It looked like we were going to Philly. We were going to be Eagles. And so she was with a friend out of town. I think they were in Chicago shopping or something. I, I don't know what, I don't know what it was, but she wasn't in town and she's calling me and, and uh, you know, I, this, this, now this is pre cell phone time, you know, and I know they were out there, but we certainly didn't have one. I don't think we had one. No, we didn't have one. So it's all landline and, you know, she's calling me and we're talking and uh, we had a couple of conversations. Well, this final conversation was a sweetheart. We're not going to Philly. And she goes, she goes, well, are we staying in Green Bay? And Troy said, no, I'm not, we're not staying in Green Bay. We're, we're going to Jacksonville. And she goes, Jacksonville? And I'll never forget it. And she goes, <laughs> she said, Tim, she said, where's Jacksonville? <laughs> and it was so funny because I didn't, wasn't, you know, I wasn't exactly sure, you know, if I'm being honest. And because, uh, listen, we, we, this is like, I think this is like in March in, in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Okay. It's, it's freezing there. We've just been freezing our butts off for two years in Green Bay. And so she says, where's Jacksonville? And I said, Florida. And as soon as I said, Florida, she yells out this big old scream. And it was so funny. Again, she couldn't have found Jacksonville on a map. I couldn't have either. <laughs> um, but she was so thrilled to go to Florida. She's a sun girl. She loves the sun. And uh, so it worked out for me professionally. And it worked out for her too, for her for uh, uh, her tan. But anyway, Jacksonville uh, soon became our home and it's been our home ever since 1994. And uh, I guess, uh, I get, well, I guess this would have been 1995. Yeah. Um, so worked out pretty good. This is where you and I crossed paths. I was a color analyst on Fox announcing NFL games. My partner was Joe Buck, who we also had on the podcast. Mm. And I told him that when we met with you before your game, it haunted me to this day. You made it very clear that you were a born again Christian and you had such a look of complete and total mm. equanimity in your eyes. It was nothing like I've ever seen before or since. It influenced me all these years later. I find myself in a situation that was my worst nightmare. Mm. But because of this, my faith in Jesus Christ has grown. God has turned this nightmare into a blessing. So thank you for your contribution to that. Who has been the biggest influence on your faith? Thank you, Tim. That means a lot. My biggest influence in my faith, boy, there's been a number of them. There have been coaches and pastors, friends, um, um, probably my biggest influence uh, was my pastor uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, for years, he, he was my pastor. And a uh, gentleman by the name of Russ Austin, who's still a pastor in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I've been very fortunate that I've had a lot of people in my life um, from high school and college and the pros in our communities where we've lived, um, multiple people that have been such incredible influences. But as far as um, at the top of the list would be would be my pastor in Jacksonville. And uh, he's just he's just amazing. He's taught me so much about being a dad and a husband and being good at both of those. And um, um, a man, a Christian. Um, so that would that would be that would be uh, my number one. You spent nine years in Jacksonville, but then. In your ninth season, you lost the starting job to a younger quarterback. But you still had gas in the tank, so you head to Washington, D.C., and after overcoming an injury, you find yourself right back up on top in 2005. Then take Washington to the playoffs. You had to think, this is it. I'm back. <laughs> I know that crossed my mind. Um, it was... When I left Jacksonville, well, first of all, let me back up. I thought I was going to be able to finish in Jacksonville. That really doesn't happen anymore. Um, 
like it used to. Uh, obviously, guys like Tom Brady, even Joe Montana, um, uh, Brett Favre, guys that you would think would stay their whole career with certain teams, you know, find their next stop. That happened with me. Uh, but early on with the Redskins, um, it didn't go real well. The next year in uh, 2005, we kind of turned around a little bit and we had a, we had a good season. And really after that, <clears throat> we struggled a bit. So my time in Washington was up and down, although it was a, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I got a chance to play for go, uh, Coach Joe Gibbs, which was really, really cool. And, um, but it was, it was good. Uh, took my family and moved up to Washington, D.C., which was really good for us on a, a on a, a bunch of different levels. But um, but it was good to get that second opportunity. And in that second ta- uh, second opportunity, I got a little little bit of success. So uh, I'm grateful, really thankful for my time uh, uh, with the Redskins. Mark, I'm going back a step. Uh, I, know okay. we, I know we moved on, but I'm just so curious on the on the personal level. I saw it you got, you know, visibly emotional. And my dad was talking about how much, you know, your faith meant to him and how he kind of looked at that as a, a pillar of support, whether, you know, and you guys never had never spoken about it till now. I'm just curious what, you know, what's kind of going through your mind when you hear something like that, that you got, you know, it meant so much to you. I could see in that moment. You know, Troy, it's the older you get in life. Um, you're able to accomplish a lot of things, um, I was able to accomplish a lot on the football field, and I'm very proud of that. The relationships that I have uh, made through this sport, um, the places we've lived, a Super Bowl championship, a national championship, a Ro- uh, you know a Rose Bowl championship, all these things, and um, they're great and they're wonderful. And but really, when it's all said and done. You want to know that your life made an impact because all that other stuff fades, Troy, right? It does. It's, it's wonderful. And I'm not taking away because I'm grateful all of them, such blessings. And, and, but as you look back, you want, you want your life to have meant something. And then, you know, it has with your children, you know, it has with your wife and your close friends and your family members, your brothers and your parents, but then out of the blue, you hear that your life, based on a 20-minute conversation, your testimony made an impact on, on somebody, and you didn't even know it, and it was lasting, and it was impactful, and it was life-changing, and you get surprised because just because you said you know a couple sentences that, that changed somebody's life, um, it's a far greater worth than any, anything I've ever done in the field. It's lasting. It's eternal. It means a ton. And I'm grateful. Um, and uh, that's the cool stuff, you know? Um, that's the stuff that has meaning. And uh, I could go on and on, but those are the bits that's... Uh, and really, honestly, the older you get, that's that's like... You know, it's like, man, you just want to know that when you leave this place, whenever that is, did I make an impact? Is this world a better place um, because I was here? Well, you know what? You know what? Um, for Tim Green, it is. And I'm and I'm thankful for that. And I think that's really cool. And uh, and I had no idea that was coming. And so thank you. Thank you. All right, Troy, ask a question. Dang it, will you? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, when, when my dad was telling um, Joe Buck that story, he said, you know, he, he asked the question he asked was, he said, Joe, did um, you ever interview somebody and, and it haunted you? And I got so nervous because I'm like, oh my gosh, my dad's gonna, you know, our our podcast all positivity and uplifting, and 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's going to bash somebody. And then he goes, that happened with me with Mark Brunel. I'm like, oh my, you know, I've never heard a bad no. thing about you. I'm like, oh no, what's he going to do? And what did Brunel story, say? Yeah. <laughs> and then the story came out and um, Joe Buck was like, you know, he's like, I see Mark. I talked to Mark. He's on the coaching staff. You know, I got, I got to connect you guys if you're not connected already. And I said, no, I don't, you know, anyway. So yeah, there's a, there's a beautiful, beautiful story. All right, That's dad, cool. I'll, I'll, I, I won't uh, drag us back to the emotion anymore. Let's get back to, let's get back to business. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's awesome though, Mark. And I really agree with what you're saying. Like I'm, I'm younger than you guys, but it's even as I've gotten older, when I had kids, I said to people like, you think, you know what love is until you have kids. And it's like another chamber mm -hmm. and your heart opens up. You know, it's like, it's yeah. almost like that, uh, that Christmas movie, the Grinch, right? Like his heart grows three sizes all of a sudden right. you're like, and then not only do you realize how much you love your kids, but you realize how much your parents loved you and all the things the sacrifice they did for you. You don't even, when you're a kid, you think, you know, but you don't really know. So anyways, it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, what's important changes, priorities change accolades, you know, things with trophies mean a lot less than more real moments and, and authentic moments like that. So anyways, so true. thanks for sharing that. That, so was, true. that was really cool. Of course. I love it. All right. Back to your career. You begin the next season by setting an NFL record against the Houston Texans by completing 22 straight passes to start the game. But the team struggles, losing six of the first nine games. And they replace you with the first round draft pick from the year before. Can you tell us how that works? I think everyone will be surprised that you are expected to basically help coach yourself out of a job. Yeah, it's a really good question. So if you are a veteran, this is how it works mostly. At least it's my experience, twice, unfortunately. If you're a veteran quarterback and you've been around the block eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years, whatever it is, and, and a team that you're playing for drafts a first round quarterback, guess what? Your days are probably numbered. <laughs> That's just the way it works. And that happened to me twice, once in Jacksonville uh, with Byron Lefwich, the second time in Washington with Jason Campbell. And listen, I get it. You know, uh, I've, I've been on the other end of that, being the young quarterback that, you know, took a, a veteran's job. So I understand the business uh, and it's hard. But, you know, and, and I've never thought it was my responsibility to develop or help uh, that first round quarterback that's eventually going to take your job. I don't think it's my response. It was never my responsibility, but I was glad to do so. Um, Byron and, and Jason, great kids, uh, talented football players, good quarterbacks. They went on to have, you know, solid careers, but you know, it's just part of the business. And, you know, every year, uh, as a starting quarterback, you have to produce. And by producing, I mean, win football games. And as soon as, you know, for whatever reason that is, you're a starting quarterback and you're not winning uh, a lot of games or winning enough games or taking to your taking your team to the playoffs, they're going to replace you. And um, especially when a new head coach comes in and uh, it's just part of the business. But I was fortunate to play a long time and I started for a long time. And if you stick around long enough, you know, you're you're going to you're going to get replaced. Um, in my career, I've been I've been benched multiple times. I've been booed multiple times. I've been traded a couple times. I've been cut. Um, I've kind of been through it all, um, but uh, uh, but nevertheless, I'm still very grateful for for the uh, for the longevity at least. But uh, they weren't they weren't always Super Bowls and Pro Bowls and you know you know broken records. Uh, sometimes it was it, it was the other side of it that wasn't very much fun. Yeah, you really had like a little bit of everything. I mean, to your point. You've, you've had the highest of highs that the NFL can give and college football mm -hmm. and the lowest of lows as well. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Then you end up in New Orleans where you back up Drew Brees for two years. From everything I have heard, he is a wonderful guy. Did you teach him anything? Tim, I absolutely taught Drew Brees nothing. 
<laughs> well, then, no, that's not true. That's not true. I did teach Drew Brees how to bow hunt. It had nothing to do with football whatsoever, but I got him into bow hunting. Um, but when it came to football, Drew Brees at that time, I think it was his ninth year in the NFL. He needed no help from, uh, from Mark Burnell, I can tell you that. He was at the top of his game, and I was his backup, um, but really contributed absolutely nothing to Drew Brees' uh, professional career, other than I, you know, I cheered for him. Uh, uh, when he threw a touchdown, I gave him a high five. When he got on the sidelines, I might have, oh, I don't know, I might have bought dinner every now and then or brought him a cup of coffee in the morning. I didn't do a whole lot for Drew Brees other than just be a, be a good buddy. I, he was just, he's one of the most amazing human beings I've ever been around. Um, uh, just the football is on a different level. He's a future Hall of Famer, obviously. And, but how he managed to do everything in, in his life with excellence. And I'm not kidding. His, um, his family, his, in his business, in his, his foundation, with his children, in the community, uh, on the field, off the field, in the weight room, um, you name it. I mean, he just did everything so well. And just a great human being with a wonderful heart, um, passionate, um, not just about football, about just life and every, everything that he was into. He did everything so well. I'm amazed by Drew Brees. And when I try to describe him, people just, you know, I don't know if they've been fortunate enough to have been around somebody like this that just crushed everything in his life. And uh, it was really cool. It was really cool to be around him. But yet, a great heart. Like I said, I could go on and on about Drew Brees. I'm grateful for my time with him. Uh, we won a Super Bowl, and so we were able to share that. And uh, just a, he became a very good friend, and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful, amazing human being. You two won a Super Bowl together for the Saints. You contributed by holding for the kicker through the season, including several huge kicks. This is one of the most thankless but important jobs on the field, where you are only noticed if you mess up. Do you ever wear that Super Bowl ring? No, I don't. I'll I'll bring I'll bring out that ring if I'm asked to. You know, I might wear it to a, a Saints reunion, um, a speaking engagement, or something like that. Someone will say, you know, that has a connection with the Saints or New Orleans. Hey, will you bring your ring? I might. It pretty much stays in the safe. But uh, I cherish it. I think it's really cool. You know, I I played 19 years in the NFL and only got one of those things, so I'm very thankful for it. But you're right about the holding, and I will tell you this story. We're in the NFC Championship game playing against the Minnesota Vikings, and we're going out there to kick the game winner in overtime, and I'm the holder. And Garrett Hartley is our kicker, uh, just a wonderful kicker, just great kid, just good kicker, just awesome. And I can remember running out onto, into the Superdome to – get this game winner down this, this field goal to go to the Super Bowl, the NFC title game. And I can remember thinking if I fumbled this snap <laughs> or I drop this thing and I don't get this down for the kick, I, I, I literally am not going to make it out of the Superdome alive. <laughs> All 80,000 fans will find a way to get, a, to get me somehow. It would be the most, it would be the worst moment ever on a football field, if I just fumbled that snap or something like that, the th- the, the, those are thoughts you should not have when you're about to, you know, you, when you go out there, but I couldn't help it. Fear overcame me. And I was just terrified that I was going to drop this thing. Fortunately, we, we pulled it off. He made the kick and we went to the Super Bowl and stuff, but you're right. Holding absolutely sucks. I hated it. And every time a head coach wanted me to be the holder, um, Rex Ryan and, and Sean Payton. I wanted no part of it whatsoever, but you know, you do what you're told. And, and, uh, anyway, a thankless job, no doubt about it. The saints, you mentioned that, you know, the Superdome and the saints fans, you played for a lot of teams Are the saints. Are those the, the most passionate I'll say the most passionate fans that you played, played for, you know what? Um, I feel like they're, yes, they are passionate. I think that has everything to do with the connection that the Saints and the city of New Orleans has. Uh, the, the, the connection, the history, 
Katrina, what they've been through, what they've overcome um, through that process, you know, what the what the Saints meant to the people of Louisiana after Katrina and how they rebounded and the city came back, the Saints came back. It seems like they really did that together. So, yes, they love their fans, and they always have. Um, but I tell you what, these Detroit Lions fans, um, yeah. they're not much different. They are not much different. Um, they are passionate without a doubt. And um, But, you know, uh, I was in Green Bay. Green Bay fans are special. The history, the tradition. They've been there forever. Um, the Jets, yeah, they're certainly passionate. Sometimes that passion is not directed in a positive way when you're out winning, but they are passionate. Um, the the Reds, you know, so I think everywhere you're at, Jacksonville, um, they're great fans. It just really helps when you're winning football games for those fa- sure. fans to, you know, show their true greatness. <laughs> sure, yeah. We, we went uh, – we were at the Falcons-Saints game – this past year in 2023 oh, yeah. and, and I had never been to the Superdome before that place gets loud and they are. Oh yeah. Not in a good way. I mean, it's the most, it's, that's what makes part of what makes uh, it so fun is when people are into it. Yeah. I kind of, you know, it's as a player, you kind of, you kind of have a love hate relationship with the, with the fans. At least I, I did as a quarterback, you know, because the same fans that cheered for me, sure. um, in, in Washington, you know, overtime wins and, and, you know, all this stuff. Those were the same fans that were booing me and begging for, you know, Joe Gibbs to rip me off the football field and put someone else in. So you're kind of like, yeah, I love you, but you remember that one? Remember that one game that, you know, we, you kind of – you didn't really love me very much. So anyway, uh, yeah, booing, getting booed, it's, it's just no fun. It's, it's the worst. Part of the deal. Yeah. Your final stop playing in the NFL was the New York Jets for two seasons backing up Mark Sanchez. Did you resign yourself to mentoring young upcoming quarterbacks at that point, or did you still have the flame inside and think that if he got hurt or if he played poorly that you can have a chance to work your magic again? (laughs) That's a great question, and no one's ever asked me that. I'll tell you this. Let me back up a little bit. When I was in New Orleans, I didn't want to play, not because I didn't have the fire, because this was Drew Brees' time, and I love the guy so much that I, I never wanted him to get hurt. I wanted him to win a championship. I wanted everything that was coming to him. So, and for that reason, I didn't want to be on the, I just didn't want to be on the field. And would it have been cool? Yeah, it would have been cool because we, they had some good players or we had some good players and, you know, um, but I didn't, that was why I didn't want to play. When I got to the Jets, I was done. Um, I was absolutely done. There was uh, no fire. There was no, hope to get into the game I didn't even want to play in preseason games I didn't even want to mop up after we had you know we're up by four touchdowns in the fourth quarter I had no interest in that I was there honestly for Mark Sanchez Um, Rex Ryan called me and said listen we want to bring you here to mentor Mark Sanchez he's young he's got some growing to do he's a great kid just show him the ropes and I think Rex, I think Rex said this. I said, listen, we don't even want you to play. <laughs> I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Appreciate it. And it, which was good. I was thinking, good, because I don't want to play either. So there. Um, so I played a little bit, a uh, little mop up time in there because they made me. But uh, it was great. You know, I've always heard it say, I've heard it said, one of my quarterback coaches, in fact, my quarterback coach for the New York Jets, his name was Matt Cavanaugh. Um, Longtime NFL player, NFL coach. Um, Tim, you probably crossed paths with Matt C- Cavanaugh at some point. But he said, he said, there's this old saying in the NFL, as a quarterback, as soon as they find out that you can't play anymore, you get two more years. And it's so true. But I, honestly, I think, I think I got about six years after they found out I couldn't play anymore. I got about <laughs> six more years after that. But it is really true because you – you know, they're always looking for a veteran guy to hold down the Ford if necessary and be a mentor and all that. But, you know, I got two more years with the Jets, and I loved it. We won some games and, and uh, the playoffs a couple times. But uh, we, li- we lived in New Jersey, which I just loved. So it was a good way to, to uh, finish up my career. While you're with the Jets, something happens to you that must have tested your faith. 
after making $50 million as an NFL quarterback, you are forced into bankruptcy because of some real estate investments that went south due to market conditions. I read a quote from one of your advisors that you were just too nice. What puzzled me was that they made a big deal about you having to sell your $9.5 million home. Now, I am no expert in bankruptcy, but I remember from the New York bar exam that one of the reasons to declare bankruptcy was to insulate your primary residence. Does that sound familiar? Yes, there's a lot of things. Well, let me back up. It was a very difficult time. Um, I was heavy in real estate at the time. Uh, you know, two thousand when two thousand eight happened, um, and that was unfortunate. Um, but you know, um, the um, you know, there's a lot out there about the specifics of that. Most of which are not true, other than I did have to file a Chapter Eleven. Um, the Florida home turned out to be something fine. Um, I guess the best way to put it is, as difficult as it was, I was very fortunate to come on the other side of it. And uh, it was really, really hard. And I was, I had finally surrounded myself with some very good, uh, very good attorneys and got some very good vi advice through this difficult time and was able to kind of navigate through this. Um, did lose, did lose, uh, you know, a significant amount of money. Uh, but came out on the other side. And I think the, you know, it was one of those things that we were talking about earlier where, you know, things, you go through things and you're like, goodness sakes. And it was very, very hard, hard for me and my family. It was very public, which probably, which actually not probably, it was the hardest part. Um, just articles, written reports, you know, and, and kind of being in that group where, you know, there's, you know, the, uh, an NFL player loses a significant amount of, of, uh, of money. It's, you know, and those things still pop up and I hate seeing them. Um, I, I don't, I, uh, I think the toughest thing for me was not just the public thing and was that I did a very poor job of deciding what to invest in. But really my biggest mistake was, I did a very poor job of picking the right people around me. And that's what got me. It was, I had the wrong people, um, multiple people. I was, I was very quick. I was very too, too trusting and thinking that I had people that had my best interests at heart when they absolutely did not. I, I was taken advantage of. I was, you know, all of those things, but Really, when it comes down to it, I blame myself. Those were my decisions. I hired those people. Um, ultimately, because I hired those people, it was my money that was going into those investment opportunities that clearly did not go well. So I learned a lot about who to surround yourself with, um, regardless of what they're saying or what they're saying they believe in. Um, it was really tough. It was, it was really a difficult time. And, um, but, you know, you, you go through it, you come out the other side, you just keep fighting, uh, you learn from it and you hope that, uh, going forward, you don't make any mistakes like that, or at least people in your life, your children and, and, uh, um, your friends, they can, they can, uh, learn a lot from your experiences. And so, uh, that was something that something good that came out of that. Now, you enter a really fun phase. You coach high school football at a private school, which I'm guessing your kids go to. How many sons do you have? I'm guessing you took this job to be with your boys. Hmm. Spot on, Tim. You're absolutely spot on. So um, we've got uh, Stacy and I, we have a daughter. I mentioned she's turning 32 here pretty soon. And then we have three boys. And I took that job at the Episcopal School of Jacksonville so I could be around uh, our two youngest boys, Joseph and Luke both of whom played for me as a high school coach there. Uh, Joseph was my quarterback. Uh, Luke, who was a few years younger, was played a little bit of receiver. And then Joseph went on to play quarterback at Georgetown University. He has since graduated and works up in the D.C. area, about to get married. Um, but, yes, I coached, I coached there for nine seasons, I believe it is. And, Troy, Tim, I had the best time. Friday night football for under Friday night lights 
was awesome. I had forgotten how incredible that experience was. It's just pure. Um, now, were we one of the top programs in the state of Florida? Not even close. Uh, but we were competitive. Um, we had, you know, we, we played some tough teams. Uh, we were no match for a lot of the public schools or the southern southern Florida teams. Uh, we were a 1A team, I believe, 1, maybe 2A. Uh, but we did just fine. Uh, I had a good coaching staff. I had a good experience. Um, we, I think we had a couple playoff years. We won some games, games that we weren't supposed to win. I loved, um, I loved Friday nights. They were the best. I loved being around the kids, hardworking knuckleheads that are just, uh, don't know a thing, but think they, they know everything. Um, you laughed, Troy, you were once one. <laughs> and uh so was your dad so was i <laughs> we almost had the exact same my, my dad coached me my last yeah. few years and it was basically everything you just said exactly right <laughs> <laughs> it's the best uh you you know it's funny I, I get i got these players you know i get them when they're freshman sophomore and they have a little bit of success on the football field now meanwhile you know they're five foot nine 158 pounds but Boy, they they want to go play for Florida State or Florida, you know. Just they have no idea, really, you know, who actually plays Division One football. And all of them, because they love the sport, think that they should, you know, get an opportunity to compete at the highest level in college football. It's just kind of funny, and and uh, their parents don't think, you know, often don't think any different. You know, why isn't my son playing college football? Well, I'm sorry, man, but your son doesn't even play for us, you know, let alone you know play college <laughs> football. <laughs> so I have story after story, but. It was great. I love it. I, uh, um, and I, I could see myself doing it again. I enjoyed it that, that much. I would do things a little different, but, but uh, I just had a great experience there. It was, it was a lot of fun. You go from coaching high school to coaching in the NFL, joining the Detroit Lions. Can you tell us how this came about? Very easy. I got a phone call. Um, boy, I bet I can find the exact date. I, I want to say it's like January 4th. 2021, I believe it was 10.22 p.m. I'm in bed, and my wife and I are sitting there watching, watching, we're probably watching Friends or some show, you know, one of our shows that we watch together over and over, and I got a text from Dan Campbell, and Dan Campbell said, hey, bro, um, I think I got a chance at this Detroit job. Are you interested in being my quarterback coach? And I look at it, and I couldn't believe it. And uh, I, I kind of just, well, first of all, I texted, yes, absolutely, or something like that before I even mentioned it to my wife. <laughs> and I said, sweetheart, you, you're not going to believe the text that I got. And I just, I told her what the text was. She says, well, what are you going to say? And I said, well, I already said yes. She says, what? <laughs> <laughs> but I said, absolutely, yes. But uh, Dan Campbell and I, our head coach, we were teammates in New Orleans for a year. That was a connection. And we had stayed connected connected and I'd see him at the combine or, or different NFL games. Of course he went into coaching obviously, and we just kind of stayed in touch and it was a phone call or a text message that just came out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't looking for it. Um, but I knew that when he texted me, when he presented me with that opportunity, that the, the time was right for me, I was not going to coach at college or the pros until our children were out of the house. I did not want to miss any more of their lives. And, uh, and our son had, had, uh, had, had graduated the year before. And so we were empty nesters. The timing was right. And, um, and I went up there and, and uh, became the quarterback coach for, for Dan and had been there ever since. So the timing was perfect. The opportunity was completely out of the blue. It was total God thing. And so thankful because I'm having the time of my life coaching for the Detroit Lions. So you guys played together one year and you had that good of a relationship that he texted out of blue like that? Or do you think it was the afterwards staying in touch? Well, I think it was probably the afterwards. Now that year, I think it was 2009, he had been put on IR. So he was in training camp and he really wasn't with us for the season. So we hung out in the off season and during training camp. And I, we probably, you know, we probably went hunting a couple times or shooting guns or something, had a few meals together messed around the locker room. We were on the field together, but it wasn't like, uh, you know, uh, we became very, very, we didn't become very, very close, but I just kind of kept in touch with them. I'd see him at the combine just about every year and say hi and sit with them. Now 
I will say this. He did ask me to be his quarterback coach. But, Troy, I very well could have been, like, the seventh guy he asked. I don't know. I don't, and I'm not going to ask him. I, I don't even want to know. I, honestly, I don't think I was his first. <laughs> I think he probably had a list. But I could have been way down the list. And, you know, and, and maybe you know, he probably wanted – you know, obviously he wanted somebody that he knew that had some experience, you know, somebody that he had been around. But that very easily could have been, like, six or seven other guys. I don't know. But I don't know. I got the call. And I took the job, and uh, the rest is history. So now I'm just trying to stay his quarterback coach. <laughs> so that's that's <clears throat> that's, that's the deal. You got a job now. You got to do everything you can to keep it. What's your favorite part of the on the coaching side of of the fence? Uh, winning games, the 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 moment, whether it's the kneel down, uh, the the interception, the touchdown pass. I really believe I have more enjoyment winning an NFL football game as a coach than I did as a player. And I know that probably sounds crazy. And there's, I think there's reasons for it. But, you know, let's say you play Sunday at 1 o'clock and the game's over at Sunday at 4 o'clock. You got about, you know, less than 24 hours to really enjoy that win because it's on to the next game. But those 24 hours are great because you busted your butt all week long. You know, you're up at, you're up at 430, you're going to, you're going to sleep at 1130 at night or midnight or whatever it is, you know, uh, you've got no sleep, you're, you're working, the pressure's on you, um, game day, you can't do anything about it, you send your player out there, I send Jared Goff out there and just hope that what we've taught him, what we've communicated to him, the game plan that he goes out there and executes it, and when he does, we win, when he takes care of the ball, we win. When you and it's so rewarding to see him go out there and play really well, the team play really well, win, and then the locker room, everyone's going crazy. Um, that's my favorite part. It is my favorite part, without a doubt. We were talking to uh, we talked to Troy Aikman recently on the podcast, and he's my, I asked, I think maybe my dad asked him if he missed football, <clears throat> and he said I don't miss football at all, but I miss winning. That's it, man. That's it. I, uh, you know, it's, the, it's the winning, but it's the, I think for coaches and Troy was too smart to go into coaching. Of course he was too big to go into coach. He's way too smart also to go into coaching. Uh, it's the, it's not just the winning that game for coaches. It's the process that goes into that, you know, because on Mondays, if we're playing the green Bay Packers, you're starting on the Green Bay Packers. Okay, what's our game plan? Let's put this together. How are we going to beat these guys? How do we beat these guys? Well, um, you know, and you spend six days building up to this, and you finally, you, you hope you have a great plan. You think you have a great plan. And let's say you do have a great plan, but you turn it over three times. You're not going to win. doesn't matter how great the plan is. Or your players just don't play that well, or they just play lights out. So you don't know how it's going to go regardless and then finally you win the game. It's like, oh, that was awesome. You know, so it's, it's your locking arms with your team, your, your, the, the, your, your fellow coaches. Um, you're together with the players and the coaching staff. And, and uh, you know, you go into this game and you, you just, you know, and, but you have good players. So your odds are really good. And then you pull it off. And it's like, man, that was, that was just awesome. So that's what I love about coaching. It's the, it's the it's the locking arms together. It's it's the camaraderie that's built through it. It's you know it's fighting back after you've lost the week before. It's just it's fascinating, and I'm I'm addicted to it, man. I absolutely love it. Last year, the Lions went to the NFC Championship game where they barely lost to the 49ers. Jared Goff was integral in the team's success. As the quarterback coach, that must have made you feel great. Is there anything that you're specifically working on? that could put you over the top next year? Yes, it's great questions. Um, I will say this. For the Detroit Lions, Jared Goff had a, had a very, very good season. And each year he's been with us, he's just gotten a little better. Really, as far as – and I can't speak for other NFL teams because I haven't played on any other, any other – or coached on any other NFL teams. It really is a – group effort when it comes to preparing our quarterback um, because I have a role, obviously, but our offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson, has a 
probably the biggest role. Um, Dan Campbell is very much hands on when it comes to Jared. I mean, the head coach and the starting quarterbacks relationship has to be very close. Um, our passing game coordinator, our offensive line coach, um, you know, our quality, our, our, um, our assistant quarterback coach has a hand. Um, so we all kind of have our part in getting Jared ready for a game. And he recognizes that. Now the quarterback coach probably gets a lot of the credit, but really it's spread out over a number of guys. It really is a team effort. And I think that's what make it, makes it work. And Jared relies, you know, not just on me, but he relies on Dan and all these guys that I've mentioned. He relies heavily on them because it is a, uh, it does, it does take a, uh, a bunch of guys. And there are things that we're working on. And Tim, you know, this from your playing days in the, in the off season, you look, you look back and you're, okay, what, as a player, what do I need to do better? Where can I be better as a defense? Uh, where do we need to be better? And you work all spring and summer on trying to make those things better. Well, for us, there are multiple things that need, we need to be better at. And at the top of the list, we need to take care of the ball. We had too many turnovers last year that cost us some games. Um, and we had turnovers in the NFC title game that cost us, you know, you could say cost us that football game. Absolutely. Um, and there were other things. So we're working on being better with the football as far as our decision making from the quarterback position, um, our ball security, um, not fumbling, not throwing interceptions, things, things like that, tucking the ball. So there's a lot of things fundamentally and decision-making wise that we need to improve on. And there's different parts of our run game and our pass game, different concepts that we can be better at. So you're always as good of a season as we had last year. We're always striving to get better. And so those are things that we're working on right now. As a coach, but you also lived through it where you, you were this, the veteran quarterback and they brought in the young guy behind you Mm -hmm. with that. Do you think bringing in the young quarterback, kind of like a Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers situation or, you know, one of those, or, or uh, obviously um, Love now and Aaron Rodgers and Love. Um, is that something that you think about as a coach or are you worried about that hindering maybe in this specific case, Jared Goff's performance because he's got somebody in the back of his head who's who the, t- the team brought in? Sure. No, it's a great question. And I think, I think uh, in a lot of ways that's where I help out because I've been in Jared's shoes, you know, I, multiple times I was in a position where we brought in a young quarterback and I had to navigate through that and kind of figure out how it was, how to process that and what does it mean and what are they thinking? Cause you don't really hear anything is, are my days numbered? You know, what do I got to do to keep my job? There's a lot of uh, uncertainties when you draft a, when you draft a young kid or even bring in another free agent or add a quarterback to the room. Uh, last year we drafted Hendon Hooker in the third round. Okay. Um, this year, you know, he's, he's going into the season healthy and he's a very talented young man and he's got a, I think he has a bright future, uh, in the NFL. And so when you're Jared Goff, okay, well, the, the next guy up is, is in the quarterback room, whenever that is, um, you know, as you know, if you're Jared Goff, you're thinking, all right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure I'm the quarterback for the Detroit Lions as long as I want to be the quarterback for the Detroit Lions, you know, and uh, you're in the driver's seat as, you know, Jared Goff, of course. And listen, Jared's not consumed by these thoughts or even thinks sure. much of it, but he does know that this is a young man's game and he's entering his ninth season. And if he wants to continue to be the quarterback for a long time, which I think he will, uh, he's going to have to continue to work and improve. Now he's benefiting from being the starter for the last three years and doing some really, really good things that we hope only gets better and better. So, um, and I do think, and I'm not trying to flex or anything, but I've, I've been kind of everywhere. I've been the young guy coming up. I've been the old guy that got replaced. I've been the starter that had a lot of good years. I've kind of wore a lot of different hats in this business so I can identify with the Hendon Hookers and the, and the Jared Goffs and the, um, the Nate Sudfield, who's the ninth year guy that's kind of been the journeyman and, and, uh, um, just kind of waiting for his opportunity. So, um, yeah, it is interesting, but I'm grateful that I have a good room. We've got three quarterbacks that all work very well together and they respect each other very, very well. And um, they all want to play, but they can't all play. But right now is Jared's golf time. Jared, 
Jared Goff's time, excuse me. And, uh, um, and uh, he wants that to go on for as long as it can. And I, I am confident that it will go on for a long time. And if it doesn't, um, if something should happen, then, you know, we've got this great kid in Hendon Hooker that's, that, that, will be, uh, that will be next man up. As a, as a football nerd, I got to ask you a question that it, it's good, a little, hopefully it's not controversial. So I'll start it with this. And this is a totally hyper- okay. total hypothetical. The entire Lions quarterback room is not allowed to play in this upcoming season for this hypothetical. You can go back. You played with some amazing quarterbacks. You can go back with any prime quarterback you played with to play for the Detroit Lions this year to win the Super, you know, to, to the goal of winning the Super Bowl. You've got Brett Favre, you've got Drew Brees, you've got a lot of, I mean, a lot of guys you played with. Who would you, who would you, again, Goff can't play in this scenario. You're not picking them over, Goff. Who would you, who would you bring into battle with you? Drew Brees. All day long. You're asking me who would I want to play for the Detroit Lions this year? Yeah. Uh, that's Drew Brees. No question. No question. Just, I, I just hope Brett, I hope Brett Favre's not what, you know, <laughs> <laughs> going to see this podcast. I'm sure I'll get a text really fast. Hey, man. <laughs> no, you got to remember my experience with Brett was like his second and third year. You know, there were a yeah. lot of intersections. There was a lot of foolish plays. But <laughs> but uh, I would go I would go with, uh, with Drew Brees. I might pick Drew Brees in this system over any other quarterback uh, in the last 25 years. I'm not kidding. Wow. I'm yeah. not kidding. He was – you're brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. He was lights out. And those two, the reason I say as a football nerd is Breeze and, and um, Favre are two of my all-time, maybe my one oh, yeah. all-time favorite quarterbacks. That's why I'm like, nah, I had to ask. That's I why to, you asked. I had to sneak the question in. Am I like, am I in the top 20? Can I just like break your 20? <laughs> just tell me yes. After this, you're Done. line up the list. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I made it twenty. I made it top twenty. That's all I want. That's all I want. <laughs> Somebody's top twenty. <laughs> it's awesome. I feel like our kids are our magnum opus. So here's your chance to brag about your kids. Hmm. My children. Uh, they're mine and Stacy's greatest blessing. So I mentioned Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin is our first. She's the only girl, and I'll say it. She's my favorite, and the boys know it. <laughs> Sorry, Troy. The, the boys know it. I got one girl. No, just kidding, kind of. Um, <laughs> she's amazing. Um, she lives in Jacksonville. She's recently married, and she's married a wonderful man. Uh, she's the uh, executive director of the uh, American Heart Association in North Florida. Got a great job. She's just fun, full of life, smart, beautiful. She's just great. And uh, um, and then her brothers. Jacob, uh, Jacob lives in Seattle. He's 29 years old. He's our funniest kid. I will say he's, he's probably our smartest kid, too. Sorry, sorry to his brothers. But he's just absolutely brilliant. Like school is like a piece of cake. You know, there's always that one kid that's like super, super smart, and that's and that's Jake. And he makes us laugh, and it's just great to be around. Joseph is his younger brother. Joseph um, played football uh, at Georgetown University. Uh, he is in finance in the D.C. area. He's getting married in two weeks to a wonderful girl named Olivia, and uh, who is a Jacksonville girl. And uh, he's great. He's great. He's probably the one, I don't know about most like me, but um, – I think he's the one, uh, you know, when I get really, really old, he's probably the one that's going to visit me the most. <laughs> I put it that way. He's got a real sensitive side to him, you know, and uh, uh, he's the one that's going to come visit his his, uh, his old man. And then Luke is the baby. Luke graduates from TCU here pretty soon. And he's the baby. He's the fun one. Um, he's going to graduate with the business degree, business and marketing degree from TCU. What he's going to do with it, I have no idea. But he just has to do something with it, just something or do something. Um, but he's the last one. I love them all. Uh, it's very hard for all of us to get together. When we do, man, it is the best. Um, Caitlin has a husband. Joseph's going to have a wife. So our family's growing. And uh, it's the best. There's, there's just nothing better than we just get around each other for the holidays and we have fun and we laugh and we tease and we cut up and 
it's just the best. Family is what it's all about. And I'm, I'm so proud of my children, our children. I'm so thankful for our children. And uh, uh, they're the best. They're the best. There. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I'm, I have a, a girl and two boys and number three coming in uh, September. So I'm okay. After we, when we were done with the podcast, I need any advice you have. <laughs> oh, I got it, brother. Well, I could tell you, I could tell you, there's a lot of things I did really, really well. There's a lot of things that I really, really messed up. <laughs> <laughs> you like you, you know, sometimes you, the, the best learning lessons as a father are, are after that father has done something. Oh man, I should have, I should have done that. <laughs> I should, that was too loud or that was too firm or not firm enough, whatever. So parenting's tough, man. It's tough, but it's great. Mark Burnell, you are an inspiration to me and I'm sure anyone else who listens to this podcast. Thank you so much for your valuable time today. Tim, thank you so much. And uh, Troy, you as well. I appreciate being on here with you guys. I really enjoyed this. I'm grateful for you guys to give me this opportunity to share my story. Um, and uh, your words, Tim, to me earlier uh, are so impactful. Um, obviously, I got very emotional and and uh, I couldn't help it. Um, I'm thankful that you told me that. You didn't have to, but I tell you, you've made my day. You've made heck you've made my entire month and uh i am forever grateful and uh hopefully hopefully we could do this again thank you sir because you're an inspiration you truly are and um you're a great football player you had a great career but what you've done off the field uh has made just an incredible impact on so many people and you continue to do so and uh so i'm thankful i'm thankful to be your friend uh to know you, to be on this, on this, um, uh, with you and, uh, just thank you guys. And Troy, thank you so much. Your dad's a stud. And, uh, as I know, you know that, and, uh, I wish you guys the best and thank you for having me on. Mark, let me ask you one more thing before you go. Our goal, okay. our goal here is we wanted to, uh, just have interesting conversations with interesting people. We wanted to make sure we were very intentional. We didn't want it to be an ALS podcast or a football podcast or an author podcast, you know, we could, we didn't want to get put in a, in a box. So at the end of every episode, we ask people, um, who's somebody that, that, you know, that you think we should, you know, have on and okay. share your story. And obviously that's how, you know, we got to, to you through, through Joe Buck helped uh, make that connection. So I'll ask the same question to you. It could be from anything, it could be football. It could be, you know, it could, could be anything. You know, would um, gosh, it'd be great to get Drew on. It'd be great to get Drew on. Fascinating. Um, Dan Campbell would be amazing. Um, those would be two two guys that just just blow me away. Their their passion and who they are. And, um, what they've accomplished. Those guys would be great. But I would, I would say Dan Campbell and, and uh, Drew Brees. Yeah. Awesome. Those are awesome. Two great ones. I tell you, um, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I'm guessing Tim was teammates with Brett. Yeah. They, they actually, I was going to 90, 91. Yeah. They, in 91. They actually were, they were roommates in, uh, in training camp, the, his, uh, his year in Atlanta. I'm, we, I'm dying to hear those stories. There's some stories right there. I I, there's got to be stories. <laughs> so I actually I lived with I lived with Brett um, during our two playoff years. So season was over, leash ran out at our duplex or whatever. My wife and children went home to Seattle, and I lived with Brett for playoffs. And yes, I have stories, much like your dad probably has stories. Just stuff you wouldn't even believe. Like stuff you wouldn't even believe, right, Tim? Uh, but uh, oh, he'd be he'd be fascinating to have. Is there a story that, that won't get you or him in trouble that you could share? Um, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I'm just kidding. Yeah, there there are some. There are some. Uh, there there are some. There are some really good ones. But 
You get Brett on. I'll let him. T- I'll let yeah, him tell him. Perfect deal. All right, we thanks. all we all have stories. Thanks so much for uh, for making the time and and obviously really busy coaching and all that stuff. So we we appreciate it. All right, guys. I wish you the best. Take care. You guys are doing awesome work, man. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, nothing left unsaid. For more on Barclay Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarclayDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to tackleals.com for cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to tackleals.com.